Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. So what is that old saying about the business of politics and making laws that it is akin to grinding out sausage? However you slice it, no pun intended, both North and South Carolina legislative sessions are now in full swing. Welcome back and thank you for joining in the most widely watched source of Carolina business and public policy. I'm Chris William and thank you for watching and supporting this, this program with the confluence of spring, of summer travel plans, of business expansion, of political deal making, of tax filing. There is a lot of activity and a lot to say grace over. So we will start this week's dialogue and look at the issues that matter most in our region and later on. Local Boy Makes Good, a former Carolina's managing director of a top 10 global accounting firm. Grant Thornton's now the company's CEO. Mike McGuire joins the dialogue later. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This week's edition of Carolina Business Review features Bob Anders, co-founder of Plexus Capital, Scott Beyer, economic professor of Clemson University, and special guest Mike McGuire, CEO of Grant Thornton LLP. And now, here's Chris William. Welcome to our program. Happy spring. Uh, gentlemen, good to have you in the program. <coughs> Scott, welcome. Bob, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wow, here we are six years. It's hard to believe, but e e up till recently, we've been calling this a recovery, and clearly, this is not a recovery. This is an expansion, solidly an expansion, arguably maybe late in an expansion. Bob, when you look at your, 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 uh, your loans, your deals, your activity at the private equity firm that, that you're with, how, do, how would you characterize where we are in this economy? What is unique about it in your mind? It's been a very slow, uh, slow process for most of our portfolio companies to recover. Uh, CEOs are uh, aggressively seeking organic growth. That's difficult to find today. Uh, I think the sales teams, the client development teams, the marketing teams, the people that touch the clients are really valued in small businesses today. A lot of our small business uh, companies are seeking uh, growth through acquisition. So we're very active with mm -hmm. acquiring smaller businesses, but organic growth within uh, a contained company is very difficult today is with, really? with the slow growth. Does that, does that go against, and Scott, I promise I'm gonna give you a chance to jump in because I know you know a little something about the economy. Um, does that go against what the general headlines say about the economy that, wow, it's back, employment, uh, unemployment is low. It seems like we're firing on all eight cylinders. I mean, do you buy that? Uh, yes, I buy that in that we're clearly in a better position today than we were three or four or five years ago. But growth is still very, very difficult. We're growing at a, what I would call a very slow pace of one to two percent a year. So the small businesses in which we invest that want to grow five and ten percent, uh, you've got to grab market share from your competitors and that's very difficult today. So Scott, what, is, this, is this new norm Bob refers to about the slow growth, is this the new norm? Well, I think, yeah, I think going forward, it looks like a basically 3% growth. I think the Carolinas are going to be a little bit better when you look at employment in the region. I think both, both states have shown positive growth in terms of employment. Even though South Carolina, there's been no change in the unemployment rate, both number of people looking for jobs and people finding jobs have been increased in the manufacturing, construction um, areas have all expanded. 
Um, so no, I think you know this three percent growth that we're seeing is just going to be this constant, steady growth. And even looking forward, we don't have the same um, headwinds that we had in the past. We were always worried about something else coming along, whether it be Europe or gas prices or something else. Much of that has um, died down. Isn't that kind of what the Fed tries to do, though, Scott? Is they want to have you know, maybe the growth isn't what it's been historically, but wasn't the whole idea of ringing out the peaks and the valleys in the expansion and contraction? Yeah, if, if you go back to what they referred to as the great moderation in which you manage interest rates and then so that the economy doesn't overheat or drop down too much in a recession, that's exactly what they want to do. Um, to a certain extent, they may have achieved that. Um, let's talk a little bit about policy. Um, Bob, in North Carolina, what are, you, what are you concerned most about? Is it about the dialogue around the Republicans have overreached? Is it about transportation funding? Is it about health care? Is it about education? I mean, what kind of is at the top of your list? I think the lower middle market CEOs that we deal with are concerned about general taxes. They're concerned about health care. They're concerned about how can they attract uh, highly productive mm -hmm. uh, employees as cheaply as they can. Uh, all the income statements uh, of lower middle market businesses today are being squeezed. You, you, you've got to become more efficient. And taxes and health care represent a, a growing percentage of the cost, and they're trying to really compress those costs. Does the second active year of compliance to the Affordable Care Act, does, does that, is that still having a meaningful impact psychologically as well as statistically on these businesses? Absolutely. I think yeah. it is. Yeah, Scott, what, what do you think? Um, related to the, the impact of the Any Affordable of Care Act. Any of that or whatever you might be concerned um, well, about. Well, you know, in South Carolina, I think, you know, as we're leaving tax season here, I think that the idea of, of tax reform always comes up. And now South Carolina is faced with this idea of the infrastructure program, um, whether that will get uh, vetoed by Nikki Haley. So. I think as you think about taxes and how to reform them, it always should be an idea of what you're going to do with, with the money. So, the, so in, in rebuilding the infrastructure, it's probably prudent to raise the gas tax because those who use the roads are going to be the ones that are paying it. But on other dimensions, if you want general reform, I think then you need to uh, rethink how everything is being done. Yeah, uh, you, you talk about raising the gas tax. That has been a stickler for Governor Haley in South Carolina. Um, but the other big dialogue going on in both states is transportation. Uh, That's right. Governor of North Carolina, Pat McCrory, has floated the idea of the $3 billion in bonds for transportation and infrastructure. Scott, I'm still looking at yeah, you because yeah. in South Carolina, the gas tax is tied to a $430 million uh, financing yeah. deal to just start to scrape it at, 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 at transportation. How, how critical, when do we hit a tipping point about it reinvesting in infrastructure? Well, I, I think you could clearly make the case in South Carolina that the depreciation of the roads has been significant and with the growth in terms of population and business activity that it would be a good idea to build up the infrastructure again. Perhaps one of the things that Nikki Haley is worried about and why she may veto it is if, if you sign into this bill, then I think any time you want to come up with a new tax or new spending, it can come up that way. Maybe her goal is just to do one giant tax reform all at once, so I'm going to kill everything mm -hmm. until we all sit down at the table and put everything on the table. It seems like with everybody, you know, being the House and controlled by Republicans, they should be able to agree on more than what they've been able to Well, do. you can look to the North and know that that's yeah, not that's the that's case. True. I mean, North Carolina has been true. Very kind true. of struggling about agreeing. Yeah. Uh, Bob, not to ask you if you agree with the governor's idea about $3 billion in bonds mm -hmm. for transportation. Are we thinking the right way about transportation in North Carolina? Uh, we're progressing that way. Chris, I'm a proponent of mass transit. and. Uh, bus, light rail, et cetera. Uh, as I see more and more of our younger professionals want to be in urban areas, I see the need for mass transit. I'm a proponent for more efficiently using the uh, existing road system that we have and committing additional growth capital dollars towards mm -hmm. mass transit. Why isn't there more dialogue about mass transit? Why isn't it more popular? Uh, we, we seem to have a conflict, uh, at, at least in North Carolina today, with the uh, maybe smaller, more rural communities mm -hmm. and the urban communities. Mm -hmm. We've got Charlotte, Raleigh, Greensboro, et cetera. Uh, and I'm just not sure who's got the loudest voice up in Raleigh today. Yeah, well, that'll be the last word. Uh, did you want to add something no. to that? 
No, you'd rather not, right? You say, <laughs> if I'm going to take a pass, then I'll take a pass now. Uh, gentlemen, thank you. You know, speaking about taxes, uh, well, we're going to bring a tax boss on here in just a second. But next week on this program, her name is Ann Anderson, uh, the Honorable Ann Anderson. She is the Irish ambassador to the United States. Ireland has been very progressive and very aggressive about winning business to Ireland. We're going to find out what their secret is, how they do it, and why they've been so successful. And then uh, in a couple weeks, Minor Shaw is a name in South Carolina and in North Carolina that ring true when it comes to statesmanship or stateswomanship in Minor's case. Uh, Minor will be our guest again on this program in a couple weeks. You know, it started as the Big Eight, uh, then it was the Big Six, and then it shrunk to the Big Five, and now the world of major public accounting firms are defined as the Big Four. Deloitte, PwC, Ernst & Young, KPMG. Enter Grant Thornton, a top six accounting firm that ostensibly focuses more on culture and people and leadership than top line growth and audit and tax, which has traditionally been the case. Joining us now is Grant Thornton, Chief Executive Officer, and of course, terminal Chicago Cubs fan, Mike McGuire. Uh, Mike, welcome to the program. Thank you, Chris. I mean, you've been trying to, and I know this about you, and I hope it doesn't embarrass you, but you know, I'll probably bring it up anyway, is you've been fighting for Cubbies tickets for 30 years and you finally just got them? I finally did. <laughs> uh, you know, I was, uh, I got really excited by the time the Cubs uh, made the playoffs for the first time in 1984. <laughs> I put my name on the list, and uh, I was told at the time I was something like 29,350th on the list, and it would take about 44 years. So uh, uh, last year, uh, my assistant said, I think you got a spam call, but it's somebody that says they're from the Cubs ticket office. And I said, no, I need to take that right now, and so I called them. So it didn't quite take 44 years. It took about 29 years or so for, uh, for my name to come up. So. Uh, so that was great, I hope and it's at the right time, you know. Yeah, it, it does seem to be the right time. Uh, Mike, we can't get through this tax season or past tax season without talking to you about, um, was there anything unique about this, at least personal filing, a lot of corporate filings April 15th, but what was different about it this year? Well, first of all, a lot of our clients uh, extend, and so uh, really they'll be doing some of the final tax returns uh, in, the, in the summer and the fall, but I think some of the trends, certainly in the state on the individual side, I think there were some surprises there, but uh, I think the overwhelming feeling is really the need for tax reform, mm -hmm. uh, and comprehensive tax reform is something that we're looking at. You know, you have about 80% of all businesses file as pass-through entities, so uh, they're, they're paying it at, at, the, at the individual tax rate, mm -hmm. which is higher than the corporate tax rate. So when we talk about comprehensive tax reform, we have to think about who's really paying the taxes, certainly from you know, the, the high rate of our, of our corporate tax anyway for, for C-corporation filers. But mm -hmm. uh, I think most people are surprised by the significant number of pass-through entities, LLCs, LLPs. I mean, you all, mm -hmm. you, Bob, I think you're probably mm -hmm. one there. And, and, know that uh, well. And so, uh, you know, we really need to get beyond that and start looking about at not how we solve pieces of it, but how we solve the whole problem. Because, you know, there's going to be give and take across mm -hmm. the board on this. You're not, it's going to be very difficult to just take one slice of this and please everybody. So, uh, you know, it's going to have to be all in. Would, wouldn't significant tax reform streamlining a tax code wouldn't that impact your top line? Wouldn't that make it harder to grow the revenue? No, I don't think so because it just depends on, on kind of, you know, certainly the clients that we have. I mean, more and more companies, I mean, even, even the smaller uh, mm -hmm. companies are doing business internationally. So you have a lot of complexity as you start expanding jurisdictions, whether you're going from, you know, a state to another state and going to be expanding your business. But, but one of the things that even uh, middle market companies are doing more and more of is, establishing operations overseas, not just doing business overseas, but establishing operations. You, know, you get in these jurisdictions and, uh, you know, it depends on what's going on. I mean, if you, what if you had an operation, you know, in Spain or, or Greece and, uh, you know, if the, with the election and things that change. So, so people are always having to look at, uh, at where their operations are and how they're, they, they optimize or have the most efficient tax structure. And it's always a game that as soon as you think you have it, you know, another shell moves mm -hmm. and then it changes the whole, uh, the whole formula. So, you know, the business and tax dynamics uh, change, you know, pretty much weekly. And so that complexity mm -hmm. is something that particularly uh, the middle market kinds of companies or privately held businesses and small public companies, I think, uh, struggle with mm -hmm. because they don't really have you know, the complexity in-house to deal with that. So they rely on us. So, so in, in some respects, 
you know, more, comp even though it's simplified in the United States, it can become more complex uh, globally. Mm -hmm. Bob, mm -hmm. question? Sure. Uh, Mike, uh, when I started in this, this crazy finance business, uh, the accounting firms that we used to do business with were right down the middle of the fairway, tax and audit. Yeah. Share with us how you've grown your top line and the other services that you provide to the middle market companies today. Well, thanks, Bob. You know, it's interesting that uh, you know, the business has changed. I mean, it, it, when I started, I've been in this business for almost 33 years. When I started, you know, it was primarily audits and, and tax returns is what we did. And then you had the advent of, of advisory services mm -hmm. and some of the consulting firms. Certainly consulting among all of the major accounting firms is, is, is a significant part of their business uh, right now and, and continuing, uh, continuing to grow. But you know, as business gets more complex, it's really around uh, innovation in our industry. Things like cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is on the minds of almost mm -hmm. every CEO, no matter where we go. Uh, what are you doing around uh, you know data analytics? Uh, certainly, uh, M and A, structuring deals, merger integration, uh, and you know, a lot of companies uh, over a period of time. I mean, we all remember Y two K. I'm kind of dating mm -hmm. myself, a little bit, but everybody yeah. moved into, into more you know ERP systems. But but a lot of the the more of the middle market companies did not. And so you know, I see us even on the strategy side. Uh, strategy is so important to companies today because they're trying to figure out: Do I, you know, what do I do, and how is technology going to impact my business? I look at companies. Uh, disruption is really a key a key word that a lot of our our, uh, our clients are looking at. How's my industry going to be disrupted? I think it's funny they could, if you're in a in a group of CEOs and talking. You know, the the person that's talking doesn't think their industry may be going to be mm -hmm. disrupted, but they can tell everybody else around them how their industry is going to be disrupted. You know, they understand that. Well, everybody's going to be disrupted. I mean, I look at companies that were just dominant. I mean, you can go back to the the classics like you know Eastman Kodak, you know, going and being disrupted by digital photography, mm -hmm. even though they had a lot of the technology. You know, they didn't place their bet in the right sure. place necessarily, and you see where they are today. You know, Blockbuster. I mean, there was a time when Blockbuster was so dominant, and look at they didn't get into data streaming, and and then you, you know you have Netflix yeah. and yeah. and others that are putting them out of business. So, you know, I think you know when you have a significant investment, it's very hard to say you know if I'm going to be disrupted, how how do I you know you can't just do away with it, but ultimately how do you transform into a company that is going forward? So a lot of our clients are really questioning that, and I think strategy plays a a key role. Mm -hmm. Scott. Yeah, I mean, you, you talked a little bit about um, working with companies overseas. One of the things, I and you can <clears throat> speak more to this, is traditionally when we think of exports and imports have been largely dominated by large firms. But in the last 10 years, more small and medium-sized firms have started to export. So a couple questions. is how One, how do you facilitate these smaller um, firms and exporting. Two, how did you see it benefiting this region? And then three, from a national standpoint, there's been some dialogue about uh, President Obama uh, getting fast-track authority. What would you think about something uh, along those lines? Well, certainly I'm in favor of fast-track and, and uh, we need to be able to enable uh, companies in the United States to export more. I think certainly uh, Things like uh, electronic payments, uh, the whole way, you know, electronic fulfillment. I mean, technology is really changing a lot of the dynamics. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that even though, you know, the dollar is so strong against the euro, I mean, there's still a lot of demand. There's a lot of demand for, for, uh, for American products everywhere. So, first of all, we have to have a fair, uh, you know, I think a fair trading or a fair uh, playing field to be able to, uh, to succeed. Mm -hmm. You know, our clients that are going international, you know, it's, it's, it's a business risk. I mean, you know, going into a company, a country, I mean, like Brazil, uh, you know, different, not everybody does business the same way that they do in the United States. I mean, negotiations are different. Uh, how long it takes to get a deal done is different. Financing and everything are different and payment terms and everything. So, so what we try to do is we work with companies to, to with our, you know, we have a, mm -hmm. a global platform. I mean, a lot of people don't really realize how large Grant Thornton is. I mean, we're in 137 countries. We have 600 offices. and. You know, somebody will ask me, you know, do we have a, an office, uh, you know, in Estonia? And I can mm -hmm. tell them the managing <laughs> partner of the talent office. And mm -hmm. so we can bring people together 
And so it's really a point to point service. So they're not operating with us necessarily on, on advising them on how to do business yeah, in Estonia right. or Latvia or someplace like that. They're mm -hmm. actually working directly with our partners on the ground that know the business environment, the tax mm -hmm. environment, you know, what's the most efficient way to uh, put capital in the country? And even more importantly, how do you get the capital uh, back yeah, out, right? right? You know, you can go into a place like Vietnam or some place of China and others that, you know, if you get it locked up, then how do you ultimately mm -hmm. bring it back, whether you can bring it back at all, or certainly repatriating earnings back to the United States, which has certainly been a big uh, topic for, <laughs> for a long time in the taxation of that. So, uh, you know, you really have to think about, really be strategic. It's nice when, when you have an opportunity to do business in another country, but, uh, you know, when you open that up, uh, you know, there, mm -hmm. there are a lot of risks uh, as well. I mean, I think it's risk that can That's certainly right, yeah. be managed and mitigated, but you have to make sure that you have the right advisors right. to get into so, that. So, yeah. Mike, let me, let me tie together something. So you just said when you're answering the question to Bob, you were talking about uh, disruption. Um, and, uh, and then you just talked about mitigating risk. You are in an industry that has traditionally tried to clamp down on risk and right. be pretty conservative about the way they run their business model and the way they advise their clients. So when you have uh, a company like, oh, I don't know, Amazon that loves to be in the disruptive space, sure. how, how, I mean, how do you think about Grant Thornton specific to disruptions coming? How can you embrace it? How can you make Grant Thornton really kind of like the slingshot you know, use the gravitational pull of something like that to slingshot Grant Thornton out past maybe some of your competitors. So how do you take that and change the culture in disruption? Well, you know, disruption, um, disruption can actually even the playing field depending on where you are. I mean, certainly, you know, Blockbuster was the giant, you know, the, the behemoth and, uh, and or a Walmart in the retail mm -hmm. space. And so, you know, you, if you use technology and you're, you, you are the disruptor as opposed to being the disrupted, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, I think that it can, it can equalize. Mm -hmm. So as people are looking at their planning horizon uh, and their strategy, mm -hmm. you know, you could sit, I'll give you an example, and I'm gonna, use, uh, I'm gonna use the soft drink industry. You've got Coke, Pepsi, and let's say Dr. Pepper. If you look at the Dr. Pepper logo, it says established something like 1885. You know, my argument is that for 100 years, uh, they've been trying to, uh, how do we get a bigger market share in the, uh, the carbonated soft drink business? But at the time they were focused on that, think back even since 1970, you know, what's happened? G Gatorade owned the mm -hmm. sports drink, mm -hmm. you got Snapple, yeah. which maybe Dr. Pepper owns mm -hmm. that now, I think, but maybe, but uh, you've had the energy drink. I mean, all these other areas, bottled water came in. Yeah. So if you look and say, I'm just looking and I'm going to try to figure out how I'm going to take yeah. market share from Dr. Pepper or from uh, Coke and Pepsi, think That's differently. Right, yeah. mm -hmm. How do I expand my offerings and look at myself in the beverage class? If they would have gone out and been an innovator outside of that, they could have changed the, the playing field a little bit more. That's what we're looking at. As you mentioned, you know, we're, we're certainly, you know, we're, we're a top five firm, uh, yeah. but, uh, and, and we're, you know, very global. But, you know, I think that disruption can actually yeah. help us uh, as we get into other services. I mean, you know, technology is an equalizer and the faster you get there, the better. Uh, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of culture, I think, you know, you have to end up addressing your culture and have to have a culture that embraces change. You know, as, as a lot of companies uh, are out there, they get so locked in and, and if they do a culture scan of their organization, they'll find that maybe the organization isn't ready to, mm -hmm. for change. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks you have change management, and change management is important. We go through a lot of change management, but change management is a process. But before you get in the process, you have to have an organization that, that's ready to adapt to change and embrace change. Yeah. And you know, I'm, with, <clears throat> you know, most people don't think that the accounting industry is one that has changed a whole lot. It has changed a lot. I mean, what, as I mentioned earlier with, uh, with, uh, with you know, consulting. I mean, consulting was almost non-existent mm -hmm. in the in the mid '70s, and today it's dominant. So there are a lot of things I think we can, uh, but we have to. You have to have a culture that embraces innovation and change to be able to capitalize uh, on on new markets. We, we've got less than a minute left, Bob. Mm -hmm. Let me just r wrap up here okay. with a quick question. So, wh what's the, what's the biggest risk for Grant Thornton, as you just talked about? Well, I, you know, I look at it as opportunity for us, and it's really adapting the organization to be able to capitalize on, on future trends, you know, embracing technology, 
uh, embracing new service I, services, ideation, innovation, and again, you know, most people don't think about that with an accounting yeah. firm, mm -hmm. but that's where I am. That's going to have to be the last word, Mike. Uh, please come back. Would you mind? Because uh, I know be we got about 10 pounds of information in a five-pound bag, <laughs> but we still left a whole lot out. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, nice to see you again. Uh, nice to see you. Welcome, Professor. Thank good to have you here. Bob, congratulations on a good year because I like know it. you guys have a head of steam going. And it's good to have you here. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for watching our program. Happy spring. Hope your business is good. If you have any questions or comments, carolinabusinessreview.org. Until next week, good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.